Grüezi Sie miteinander. Ich komme von Bern. But I'll speak in English because I think that's the official language. And um, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you very much. Shifting the, the paradigm, it's us first. I chose that in the sense that we recently heard this interesting expression, America first. <laughs> and um, I think uh, it's not about me, it's not about you, it's about us. And we just had a very, very beautiful presentation of the previous speaker, and I'd like to maintain that spirit and move forward and see how we can use that spirit and really create interesting new ways of identifying solutions that we all need. So what are we talking about? A basic fact. You may recognize what this is. It's our planet. That is all we have. The Bible starts, or the, the book starts, the first book of Genesis starts with the Garden of Eden. I prefer to call it the planet of Eden. And that is a speck in the universe, and that is all we have. By the time you actually go through that, the significance of that jewel, which is what our planet is, becomes quite significant. When we move on, I would like to start with my Garden of Eden. These are my parents. The lady in the middle is my grandmother. My mother is half from the Obervalis and half from Bern. My father is from West Africa. For those of you who are still in the commental constraints of the Berlin Conference of 1984, uh, sorry, 1884, that illusion of a construct is called Nigeria. We are from the town of Onitsha. So these are my parents. And when I was born, I was confronted with a world that was divided into black and white. And interestingly, one of the first memories I have of playing in a playground here in Switzerland was playing with, with a little blonde girl, and she was asking me, how come your color is the way it is? Wow, I, I never thought of that. And I said, well, m my father is this, and my mother is this. And she said, oh, you mean your father is black and your mother is white? I said, uh, yeah. She said, that's not true. <laughs> I said, yes, it's true. She said, no, that's not true. Yes, it's true. That's not true. <laughs> and then she said, do you know why it's not true? I said, no. Yeah, you, would, you, you, you would have to look like a zebra. <laughs> Many years later, my parents have aged, and this is the fruit of their labor, so to speak. <laughs> so that's about three generations right there. So anyway, going back to the beginning, our planet, that little jewel, that little diamond floating around in this huge thing that we call the universe, 2017 was the warmest year on record. We also have the, the five last years, from 2013 to 2017, were the five warmest years. This should make us kind of think what is happening. And the oceans are getting warmer. We have increased CO2. We have major challenges that have to make us wake up. That the actions we are having cannot continue the way they are. And one of the definitions of madness is to repeat an action 
and expect a different outcome. So climate deniers actually fulfill the definition of madness, except they don't have yet a certificate of madness. So it seems like in this university, you are taught to value cost, to determine cost, to determine profit, and all those things. And by the way, everything you are being taught in university by older people represents an old way of thinking. So keep that in mind, okay? Let's look at the US. By the time you go through the cost of drought, flooding, freezing, all the natural calamities that we have experienced thus far, for the past 20 years, it comes to a cost of 1.2 to 1.3 trillion dollars. It is now when you put that into, you quantify that, taking into account that that does not include the cost of cyclones, hurricanes. That has not yet been accounted for. And this is government statistics from the US that has determined it has cost the US economy 1.3 trillion US dollars. So if we look at that and we ask ourselves, what does this mean? you come up with the following that we have to figure out how can we take a challenge and turn that into an opportunity. How do we do that? This is something we all need to, need to think about moving forward. The current spot price of CO2 is seven euros, roughly around there. We are producing over 12 billion tons of CO2 which basically equates to a significant amount of money if you convert that. And if you overlay the projections of the increase in the cost of CO2, you end up having a potential market close to $1.5 trillion. Now, that is just facts. So the challenge is, does this allow us to come up with an interesting way of creating an opportunity? Here's a solution proposition to think about. As an aerospace engineer and as a pilot, one of the most amazing flying machines ever built was the Concorde. Flew twice the speed of sound, and the value proposition of the Concorde was very simple. We will reduce the travel time between three to, to four hours, between two city points on two different continents. That was the basic value proposition. Is it possible, I'm asking you, is it possible to replicate that value proposition in such a way that I not only take care of my carbon, my CO2 footprint, but actually reverse that and produce oxygen. Is that possible? It sounds like a total paradox. However, if you change your perspective, if you change the way you look at things, you identify opportunities. Here's one of them. First, you need to recognize that the private sector is the driver of innovation. It's not government, it's not regulation. Secondly, we recognize that innovation has the power to change human behavior. Third, we have to make sure that whatever it is we do ultimately increases the common good ultimately increases the benefits of mankind. And this is effectively my, it, 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 it's, it's the beginning of the Verdegang of my life. 
originating in two different continents, how am I able to come up with something that benefits both? The fourth point is that if you can identify something that ultimately increases the common good, by default, it's going to be profitable. Okay? So the solution, therefore, lies in changing your paradigm, changing your way of thinking, changing your way of looking at something to come up with new business models. And where are these business models going to come from? They're going to come from you guys. That's why you are here. So the, the future is not looking at me. You should look at each other. And then you begin to see where the future is. What is needed in this instance is a clear way of converting CO2 into, for example, oxygen. For that, we actually have a fantastic method. It's called photosynthesis, trees and forest. We also need an appreciation of the added value to absorb it. This means that the trees in the forest and the oceans, so the trees in the forest currently absorb 30%, 30 to 40% of the CO2, with the rest really being absorbed by the oceans, which is causing a problem with acidification, etc., which has a whole, opens up a whole chain of events. And we need a way of transferring the value of absorbing CO2. How do we do that? Or how, what is now possible? There's something called a blockchain technology. So by the time you understand some of these fundamental issues, you begin to see there's some interesting things that can be done. So if you have converters and you have emitters, you can link them up and have a situation where you can link them up using a blockchain which offers a series of processes that allows that transfer. And the unit of currency that allows the immediate transfer without any intermediaries, no banks, no this, no that, is what we call cryptocurrency. This is not a lesson on a blockchain, but this is the way it fundamentally works. So if we have an oxygen blockchain using an O2 coin as a cryptocurrency, you have a different categories of emitters who can be connected to different categories of converters and thereby provide an added value. If we do that, we can also now identify what could be done to kickstart this whole process from the emitter side. And that's what we are doing. So we are creating, on the emitter side, an aviation business model, which is called the IZEN, which in the business model, it incorporates a double CO2 offset. So we know to fly from A to B, we're going to burn X amount of fuel. That's going to cause X amount of CO2 emissions. We not only offset it, we double offset it, put that back into the business model as a cost. We accommodate that, make sure that the revenue exceeds the overall total cost so it, can, it is profitable. And at the end of the day, you have a situation where your net product is actually oxygen. And this is, becomes very interesting. By the time you do the analysis, the optimization algorithms, etc., you come up with some very interesting results. On top of that, you can superimpose the interface to the clients using a simple application. You can put in a whole series of, of, of service steps, of added value service steps, and then you can actually replicate the fact that you will, check, you will save three to four hours between point A and point B on an intercontinental trip. Today, most of the time is wasted with your check-in, your lounge, securities, etc. On the other side, when you arrive, 
to get your luggage, etc., you waste a lot of time. So by the time you optimize all of that, you can actually come up with a time savings of three to four hours. And that's what we effectively are able to do. Quickly showing you that we're not only stopping there, but we're also coming up with a very novel way of interior cabin design. Here's another way of that, using advanced ergonomics where we take certain things out of the NASA and the Russian space program that we know about uh, basic astronauts and are thereby able to come up with some, a really exciting way of moving forward. The team is an international team of various experts and the result is that we are able to replicate the value proposition of the Concorde with a, not only a zero carbon footprint, but we are able to generate net oxygen, hence working towards the reversal of climate change. And this is an example of if you change your perspective, if you change the way you think, you are able to create solutions that truly work, help, and move the planet forward. And this is all to come back again to the, or, to the original concept of us first, us as a, f a family. In our language, in Igbo, we have an interesting expression. In European languages, it say, it's, if, we, if we use English, you say, I love you. That's a verb, it's an action. We say it differently. We say aforum ginania. And that, what that means is, I see myself in your eyes. It means two things. One, we physically have to be close for me to see myself reflected in your eyes. <laughs> and two, by the time I look deeply into your eyes, it's only when I look into your eyes that I'm looking at you. Otherwise, I'm looking at your, your head, your shoulder, your arms, whatever. But I look you into the eye. I see into your soul. And if I look deep, I recognize myself. And that is the true expression of love, which again is the underlying principle of the African philosophy called Ubuntu. I exist through you. My humanity depends on the way you treat me. And so, in ending, I will just say, basically, Afurum Ginania. Look at each other, look into your eyes, recognize each other, and basically say, it is us first. Thank you very much.